Hey folks, Quilly Dean here, and welcome to another episode of Let's Play Aurora 4X. A fair amount of time has passed since the last video, but nothing too terribly exciting has happened. I've been holding off doing anything too, too fun uh, while I just wait for some technologies to go um, because it is time to build our battle fleet. We are starting to run out of good mining targets in the solar system, and it's time for us to finally consider exploring things beyond the current solar system. Uh, mostly so we can continue to find new rocks. We're almost like, we're gonna be done strip mining the solar system. We need to strip mine the entire galaxy. Now, things are not quite that dire. Uh, I have finally set up a proper uh, mining colony over here on Mercury. It's actually got 200 auto mines. It is mining over 10,000 units of minerals per year. Keep in mind a mice driver can only do 5,000 units per year. As a result, I currently have two uh, mass drivers on Mercury. Uh, we may ship out a third one a little bit later, because what's going to happen now is we're actually going to start to accumulate a stockpile of stuff on Mercury. Um, and really, I mean, it's not like it's going to deplete anytime soon, so probably another mass driver will actually be called for. How are things going on Mars? Well, the terraforming is still happening. The rate's gotten not too bad. It can actually do a full atmosphere in almost uh, just a little over five years now, which is much better. We're um, about halfway, actually almost 60% of the way to our goal of having one atmosphere worth of oxygen. And that's just uh, increased. We got a bunch more technologies that came in. Uh, it was, I was able to uh, research more of the atmospheric, um, the, the terraforming technology, so it's happening a little bit faster, which is going to be really nice when we move all this over to, um, to the moon. So we've got that. And at some point, we can also terraform Mercury. Mercury's a little bit more intense. It's got a 16 planetary suitability. Um, and that's because of its incredible temperature. It's insanely hot over there. But I think what we can do is use anti-greenhouse gases uh, to basically help block out some of the sun and bring the temperature down on Mercury. Um, and we will get there a little bit later. So what are we looking to do right now? Well, to build a fleet, I have gone and researched a fair amount of engine technology. Um, I don't know if we can really see here. If I go and look at power and propulsion, I mean, I still have lots of things queued. I really want to finish this um, this fuel consumption of 0 0.5 liters per engine. I want to finish that before we design our ship. Um, and actually, I guess, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to slow down this research rate upgrade. It's very nice, obviously. But I'm going to slow that down. I'm going to go and put everything in here because the first thing I want to do actually is do a new engine for our maple syrup A. The maple syrup A has been parked around um, Earth right over here for quite a long time because it turned out that it actually had didn't have quite the fuel economy needed to scan the last two systems out in the outer rim of the outer edge of our solar system. In addition to that, we really need to get a grav survey ship up and running. Uh, both those things will be relatively light little ships that are just designed to do some little scouting. I could add a grab survey thing to the Maple Syrup A's design, but I think I'm going to design a separate ship for that. So, what we're going to do is we're just going to advance for now. Uh, when was that tech going to finish? It's the engine consumption. January 56. So we've got to wait another half year. I'm going to go 30 days at a time over here. Um, also, oh, my planets are starting to complain about, uh, or at least the moon is starting to complain about lack of protection again. But we'll deal with that soon. Corbomite on Sinope is done. Right, so Sinope, which is a moon of, uh, I want to say, Saturn? I'm not sure. Was a place where I did set up a new mining colony. Uh, it had a really good accessibility of things, but it actually doesn't have that much stuff. So it's going to get depleted relatively soon, and then we'll move all this off somewhere. Oh, by the way, I, I um, started using this group by function thing, which is awesome. Uh, it's a great way to sort your stuff. Uh, Noijman over here is actually another one where things are starting to deplete, but it's worth noting it had a, has a protect production well above 5,000, especially since I got some extra mining tech. Uh, as a result, it's got a stockpile of stuff that is accruing over there because we only have one mass driver and it can only send 5,000 per year. But as these things start to run low, and you can see the Vanderite's going to run out in 1.3 years over here, um, eventually it'll just be able to send things out. So it's okay that there's a bit of a backlog of materials over here. I'm not crying about that. And it is out of neutronium. It was a good little planet, but it is running low. I expanded to Vesta over here. I can't remember. Maybe I did that in the last video. I'm not sure. Um, it's going to run out of uranium soon. And there, it's got production slightly over 5,000. So it's got a bit of a backlog, but not much. And these things are going to trickle down again. It's not the biggest rock in the world, but it's got a good amount of corundium, which is really what it was there for because we ran out of corundium a while ago on Earth. And what is Earth building right now? Currently nothing, actually. It is expanding its shipyards. I did build two of the shipyards over there, and we're going to try to add some capacity to the industrial one and the commercial one. 
which I have not renamed yet. So I am going to rename the rename shipyard, the commercial shipyard to the arrow shadow shipyard over here. And the second one this is our military one is going to be, um, oh, I got it. I need to put in like a something else, right? Repair and construction like the, I don't know what was it called before I'm not sure uh, repair marine services Inc actually I just I do like marine services Inc so we're gonna keep that there uh, and arrow shadow we do have to add hey what let me just auto rename so we'll get an interesting little footer there oh and sons I like that so just just something to get an idea so it's gonna be arrow shadow and Sons Limited. There we are. Anyway, so those are um, just expanding. I should probably put continual expansion on the civilian one because it's going to have to be pretty big. But the military one, that 10,000, is going to be awesome. Okay, Corbomite going away. So I'm just waiting for that new engine efficiency tech. And then what we're going to do is we're going to design a new engine for the Maple Syrup A and also design our gravitational survey ship. Mm, some new technology, some new warhead technology. Excellent. That's going to be really important for things that are coming up soon. Overcrowding, magazine research, and starting on magazine. E oh no, it's finished magazine ejection. Starting on magazine feed systems. Uh, Quotes Colony is launching some more ships. That's fine. And we are now going to be January which means we've got the new fuel consumption. We also finished adding our capacity to the um, to the Arrow Shadow and Suns. Again, this would be a really good candidate for continual expansion, but I'm worried that I'll forget and I'll just run too many minerals. We are getting, with this 10,000 complete, we're going to get back in the place where you can build new freighters, which is nice to see. Okay, so we have a new engine efficiency tech. So let's go ahead and design uh, a whole slew of new engines. Our current technology is magnetoplasma drive technology. I don't know what it is, but it sounds awesome. So that is our current engine technology. Also, it's worth noting that I've researched the ability to shrink our engines down quite a bit more. It used to be that uh, times 50, so a half size engine, which is as good as we could get. But now we can actually get to quarter size, or not size, it's not size, it's power. So now we can get to a one quarter power ratio, which has a ridiculously good fuel economy. And we're building a civilian ship here. Uh, we don't need it to go fast. We just need it to be very fuel economic. So we're going to take the minimum engine power that we can possibly get. We've also got um, a built in fuel consumption just globally across our empire. We're only using half as much fuel as we used to, no matter what size ship we're using. And this is a civilian engine, so it does have to be at least size 25. <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do is go to the size 50, though, for maximum fuel efficiency. Uh, it's going to be a 200 engine power commercial magnetoplasma drive. Um, I think we're going to need a new company for the magnetoplasma stuff. Uh, this is going to be uh, Dorava Magnetics Inc. This is the company that's going to make this. So they've come up with a new drive system. This is the commercial variant of it. At 200 engine power, that's not any more powerful than any of the engines that we've done before. We have something else that has 200 engine power. But the this is going to have like a ridiculous amount of range compared to the others. Um, it's going to be ridiculously fuel efficient. We're going to be able to go anywhere with this. So we're going to create that one. We're also going to create a military version of our Magneto Drive. For our military, I mean, we could use the commercial engine for our military ships. It's perfectly fine. But what I think I'm going to do with the military, I'm, I'm willing to accept uh, a less fuel efficient design in exchange for getting a better power to weight ratio. Now, how much do I want to go? I could go all the way up to adding 25% more engine power but I would begin adding 75% more fuel consumption. I think I'm gonna stick at the sweet spot for my military ship of about the times one over here. So that way the fuel cost doesn't start to skyrocket, but at the same time, we're not nerfing our performance either. We still are gonna get you know, good fuel efficiency from there and we can get more fuel efficiency from the engine size. You can see though, this engine, which is exactly the same size as the commercial engine we just designed, right? It's literally, it's size 50, it's exactly the same size, but it's four times as powerful, 800 engine power. Now that's a size 25, which is a pretty large thing. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, the Aurora 4X wiki is always offline these days because of too much traffic. I can't imagine why that might be, you guys. Um, and I don't remember what the weight per hull size is. There's this button over here to show size in tons. 
Oh, it works. It doesn't work for a lot of components. <gasps> oh, that's good. Okay, so I think it's times 50, which I guess we could see quite clearly. If I set this to times 10. Okay, yeah, so it's the weight times 50. So if this is a 2,500 ton engine, that might be a bit too much for us. I don't know how big of, an, of a ship we want to design. I've actually got, we're going to load up a spreadsheet in a moment here for our military ship design, which I want to talk about very soon. Um, but I really want to target somewhere around five or 6,000 tons. So if our engine itself is 2,500 tons, that might be a bit much. So I think our military drive will actually be designed at say 25 hull size or 1,250 tons. That should leave a lot of room for other systems. It's 400 EP. Push comes to shove, we could always throw two of these on or redesign it. Although the design, I mean, this is going to cost 2,000 research points just to complete this design, which is pretty pricey. Um, so we're going to, we'll tell you what, we'll, we'll go with something like this. So I'm going to create that. It's the Durava Magnetic Inks is also going to come out with this variant of it. And we're going to go ahead and close this out. Now we're going to have to research that stuff. One of the things I want to do, one of these screens gives us all our, our designs, doesn't it? I'm not getting tooltips. I'm sure there is a screen. Oh, view technology. Yeah. I often uh, open it from a different screen. If you go to your design view, you can hit um, view text over here. So that will open, not that screen this screen over here that shows you all our technologies. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to obsolete all our current technology because all this stuff that we use to build our PDCs, they're completely out of date. We have so much better technology. What else do we have here? All of our old engines. That's interesting. Why is this in the list? It hasn't actually been designed yet. I didn't do the research. Oh, maybe I did try to do a design here. Because this is, I don't think, the same fuel efficiency. I don't think this is the one I just designed. I'm pretty sure that's another one. Hey, remember the uh, the Light Corp 2.5 engine power? Our very first engine that we designed. We've come a long way. Let me check over here under power and propulsion. Yeah, the two Durava Inc. engines are in here. I think the other one is one I just did as like sort of a test to, to fiddle around with things. Look at the, the difference in research between the commercial ver variant and the military variant. Anywho, we're going to go and grab Laura Hansen over here, who's up to a 60% research bonus. Amazing. And she keeps getting promoted, so she can run a lot of labs. We're going to get her going on the commercial engine. And then I'm going to click here to select her. I'm going to click on the military one and then hit Q. So she'll work on that as soon as she's done. You can see we can keep researching more and more fuel efficiency, all kinds of different things. We're going to get her research these two engines first, and then we're going to see what we want her to do after that. So let me just go in advance in five day chunks until she finishes the first engine. Excellent. Okay, the commercial engine actually just finished in the five-day chunk, which is perfect. Now, what we're going to do, our designs over here, we're actually going to go and um, obsolete a lot of these two. Did we ever build the dead meat? We must have... Wait, well, hold on. Hold on. Well, no, because... Okay, we don't have an active one. Did I end up telling one of my shipyards? Oh, it's designed to provide it. Okay, but we never actually built a dead meat. Because we never finished the gravitational survey scans. So, what's the design look like? You know what? I don't think we're going to use it. I think we're going to use the new engine variant because gravitational survey scan does require going quite far distances, and I'm not I'm not happy about this range. Um, so I'm going to copy the design because we're going to keep the name Dead Meat because apparently Dead Meat never got a ship named after him. But we're going to go ahead and mark this as obsolete, and we'll hide obsolete as well. The Dead Meat copy, we're going to say the Job. We're going to obsolete you. Whoops. Kirk Dick as well and the light. Maple syrup A, we're gonna create a copy of you and we're gonna obsolete the base version. Uh, the Prestonian was never a real design, it was just the, like the next name that came up when I generated a new class. And the Valdir cargo ships, we're gonna obsolete you as well. Oh, and the Speedy Savant, you're super old. Okay, there we go. So the Maple syrup A copy. So this is going to be exactly the same as our current Maple Syrup A. So this is, Maple Syrup A is our geological survey sensor uh, ship. Technically, we have a few more of these things to scan in our system. And we would like a new design to scan wherever we go next. So I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this the Maple Syrup A uh, Extra Sticky. Should probably just call it the Mark II, but I kind of like this. 
So the maple syrup, syrup A, extra sticky. We're going to remove the old engine. So look, the power is going to be exactly the same. 200 engine power, 200 engine power. I believe the weight will also be exactly the same. Um, so right now we have a weight of 3,300 tons. And the speed will be the same. We'll still be at 3030, assuming that the tonnage is the same. Let me try this. No, it's actually slightly lighter, which is interesting. So we get slightly more speed because it's lighter. But here's the important thing. With the old ship, we had a range of something... I, I got rid of it too soon. We had a range of something like 30 billion kilometers. I guess I can check. If I show the maple syrup, 30 billion kilometers was the range of the maple syrup, A, eh? The extra sticky has 354 billion. It's got more than 10 times the range, which is crazy and awesome. All right, so um, that's the Maple Syrup A Extra Sticky. We're not making any changes to it. We can make sure it's on the newest armor. If I, uh, You can't choose what the armor is. There's not a pulldown for it. Ships automatically designed with the best armor, but if you make a copy of an existing ship, it could still have the old armor in its memory. So there's a button down at the bottom right here for new armor. If I click that, there, it switched from the, uh, what was it, the high-density Duranium to Composite Armor. Still only has an armor rating of 1, but that saves it a tiny bit more weight as well, so we squeeze out a little bit more speed. Excellent! Okay, <clears throat> so that's our Maple Syrup A design. Uh, and then what we can do is if we go to Earth Manage Shipyards, we're going to refit the Yellow Dog Shipyard for the extra sticky, which takes no time and no materials. So we're going to do that. Uh, if I skip ahead, we're going to need two five-day skips over here. And another. <clears throat> there we go. So Yellow Dog, sh Yellow Dog Dockyard can now refit the Maple Syrup A class named Maple Syrup A that's in orbit around Earth. We're going to refit it to an extra sticky. Takes a little bit of material and it's going to take just over a month, or nearly two months, uh, in dock to do that. <clears throat> but then it'll come back, it'll be a Maple Steer Sticky A, which will be able to reach very, very far. Okay, so that's one. The other thing we're going to do is the dead meat over here, which I'm going to rename simply to the dead meat, because we never got the previous one. It's got a gravitational survey scanner sensor, and... Um, yeah, I don't think I did this on screen. I think I was doing this in between episodes. And we're going to replace the engine with the Drava Me uh, Magnetics engine, which is going to give it huge range and speed. Now, here's an interesting thing about this design. Military vessel. The gravitational survey sensor <clears throat> is classed as a military component, and there's nothing we can do about that, to the best of my knowledge. Therefore, the ship automatically gets classed as a military vessel. As a result, it has this line of text. Our maple syrup does not have that line of text. It has this. It has te technically you do require a um, an engineering space. The maple syrup A has an engineering space on this, so it needs that. That engineering space technically has um, maintenance spare parts of 40, which is not enough to repair its biggest part, but it doesn't matter because as long as it's got an engineering space and no military components, it's classed as commercial, so you don't have to babysit it, you don't have to repair it, it doesn't break down, it looks after itself because it has, you know, lower tolerances. It's okay that a few things break down a little bit, it's not a huge problem. But the dead meat over here <clears throat> is a military vessel because of that part. As a result, it has this line over here. And what this line determines is how frequently parts will break down at least in terms of the tolerances that we have for the military. Right now, we have an annual failure rate of 30%. Every year, there's a 30% chance that something on the ship will break. In addition to that, it has a maintenance life of five years. As we use up this maintenance life, and especially if we go above the maintenance life, the annual failure rate will go up, and you're going to be more and more likely to have things break. Now, we have 126 spare parts on our ship, and the biggest thing on our ship would need a hundred to fix. That is the um, that is the scanner itself. The gravitational survey scanner needs would need a hundred parts if it broke down. So we have enough parts to repair anything on our ship that might break down, which is fine. I mean, we can't repair it more than once, but that's okay. Uh, that's not so bad. <clears throat> Maintenance life is really, really, really quite long on this ship, which is really nice to see because this is going to have a pretty long and extended mission. I think this design is actually perfectly fine. I don't think we have to muck around with anything. Of course, we have the three engineering spaces. I must have made a video with this. I remember talking about some of this. We have three engineering spaces, and that's to help um, bring the maintenance life up and the annual failure rate down. It was also, I think I put in three because we didn't have enough spare parts. If I just bring this down to one, 
There we go. We, um, we don't have enough spare parts to fix everything. So if uh, our scanner broke down, we'd be screwed because we wouldn't be able to repair it. Also, our annual failure rate has gone up dramatically. Now, what I can do is add a maintenance storage bay. This will add a thousand more supplies. So then we have more than enough to repair everything, but note that the annual failure rate didn't go down. In fact, it went up because we have a bigger, more complicated ship and we don't actually have any more engineers. So I think the thing for this design actually will be there we go. Something like that. Two big engineering spaces and one small one. Annual failure rate of 34% when we have just enough parts to fix any one thing that might go wrong, which I think is going to be perfectly sufficient. Hopefully. It's not a high priority ship, so it's probably going to be just fine one way or, or to other. All right, so this is the design for the dead meat. It has huge range and it can do gravitational surveys for us. Sounds great. So, um... We're still waiting for that other shipyard to finish its thing. And we're only really going to produce one. Um... Oh, did the refit finish? No, no. <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah, this is just not updated yet. If I skip ahead, it's going to tell me that you're refitting. Oh, well, that's a shipyard activity. That makes sense, actually. That doesn't show up. I'm going to wait until um, the maple syrup A gets finished. Then I'm going to refit this um, yard to build me a, um, a dead meat which hopefully has been classed correctly. Yeah, we'll get it to build the dead meat. And then after that, we'll go and do, I don't know, something else. We might redesign our, our cargo ships, for example. It's gonna be much nicer to have more fuel efficient cargo ships. So A, we waste less fuel and B, they can go a lot further, which is nice. Oh, cargo task group one, finish the automated, um, the automated mine job because we are officially out of mines, of automated mines on earth. Notice the mines itself. I had about 400 mines on earth. Uh, I think is the amount we built up to. I converted 300 of those into automated mines. Converting the mines is cheaper than building them. So automated mines normally take 120 and 120 to build, but converting an existing mine to automated takes only 75, 75. And we're starting to run low on minerals on earth. So we don't really need as many conventional mines here anyway. Um, the biggest thing we, we are gonna have are, is the sorium over here and that's okay. So we're relying more and more on external uh, shipping to send us that. I think, oh, I have an extra mass driver. Excellent. Because I was gonna say on Mercury, which is where we keep sending these things, we could really use a third mass driver. So let me go ahead. It's gonna be a very simple little job for cargo one. You're gonna go to earth. You're gonna load one and only one mass driver. And then you're going to go and unload on Mercury over here. Unload all installations and then go back to earth. <clears throat> that might honestly be the last job that we do for these guys. In fact, we should also scrap the colony task group. Oh, bunch of research labs just finished. We finished, what did we finish? I think I missed it last tick. Whoops. Research complete. Oh, into the uh, the, the uh, military drives, excellent. So we're gonna need those for our military ships. We can probably start working on them now. So now the question is, what do we wanna do with our labs? Well, I wanna get the next level of uh, grab sensors. These are our active sensors, which are gonna be important for our missile systems. Uh, we'll also go and put a little bit into this and, oh, that's your cap. Is that it? I think, okay, so that's fine. So let's go and put it into the magazine feed system. Basically everything that we're gonna to need to actually get our uh, ship going and they're gonna finish at roughly the same time. Here, we can pull the lab off. Oh yeah, we really weren't getting much in the way of efficiency from the additional labs anymore. So we'll slow you down a bit, speed you up a bit. So you'll finish all at roughly the same time. There we go. Um, so we finished the military thing. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna start designing the military ships yet until we get here, although, this is gonna be a great time to find out if we're basically in the ballpark for our military design. <clears throat> so let's just make a dummy little ship here. Um, we're gonna throw on the military engine. So first of all, it has a range of only 15.5 billion kilometers. That's not bad. We don't need these individual ships to have a massive range. Ideally, we'd actually like to build a, um, uh, a fuel tanker to follow them around. A nice big slow fuel tanker, but that can hold a lot of fuel. Meanwhile, these stay light and very fast uh, without much range. But that seems a little low. We'll probably want to give them a second one. Right now, they're going at 12,000 kilometers per second, which is great. But we haven't actually, you know, obviously put any systems on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw on some heavy systems just to bring up the weight. Oh, that's not actually very heavy. Um, what's a heavier thing? Well, not the recreational. Actually, no, no. 
That's way too heavy. There, this should be very nice. So now we're in a range of about 5,000 tons. We've got a speed of just over 400 kilometers per second. Yeah, I think that's probably okay. Or 4,000. Did I say 400? I think that's probably okay. So once we get this up to maybe even 5,000 tons, depending on how many... Um, how many missiles and things we actually load on here. Well, our speed will probably be sitting right around 4,000 kilometers per second, which I think is more or less what I'm going to ballpark. We could build an engine that's twice as powerful. Obviously, it will weigh twice as much. And right now, the engine is about a quarter of our weight. The bigger engine would be, um, well, would maybe be close to about half our weight, right? Because if we're looking to design a ship that's 5,000 tons, and the engine is 2,500 tons. So 50% of our ship would be engine, which I think is overkill. I think it's too much. I don't think we'd get efficiency. Plus, the engine has to push itself around. So I think we're going to be quite happier go with the engine design we've got here. I'm, I think I'm going to be very satisfied with that. Okay, so I'm just going to delete this because we're not actually building that ship. We are going to wait until this missile technology uh, right here and the sensor technology finishes, at which point we will design all of our weapon systems. Um... Oh, and I was going to scrap some stuff. Yeah, I think we're going to do that. So, manage shipyards. I don't know. I think anyone can scrap it, technically. Like, Sarvath, you're not doing anything. So, can you scrap the job that's sitting in space? It looks like the answer is yes. Excellent. Do that. And actually, this one here that's doing the capacity, can you scrap the Valdir freighters? Oh, there's no ship in orbit, right, because they've still got a mission going on. Fair enough. But I think we're going to do that, and I think we're going to redesign those ships in a moment here. Or we'll use the uh, civilian shipping more often because we can just, you know, put in commands and orders and stuff like that. Yeah, n insufficient military production protection. We're getting there. Cargo Task Group 1 finished its orders. And I think I'll scrap one. I might not scrap them both. Oops. I might not scrap them both, but we can probably trim one away, get some of those resources back. And I think the plan will be to get rid of both, but let's scrap the Valdir 1. Or the two, sorry. We'll keep the Valdir one for a little while just so we have options. But we'll start to use the civilian shipping a bit more. Civilian shipping doesn't uh, use us any fuel of ours, which is really nice. This is a graphic glitch. It shows these cargo groups and colony things like moving away. They're clear. They're definitely in orbit around Earth, but yeah, they move oddly. Okay, we finished the magazine feed system. Oh, missile agility. Now, we don't need to... We could start working on our new sensors, even if the missile agility hasn't finished, which is going to be okay. Turret tracking speed is also going to be very important for our close-in weapon systems that we want. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish the grab sensor, and then we're going to start building our active sensors, and then while we move more labs over to our actual missile research. Tracking speed is done, so we've got some labs. Do we want to get more tracking speed? Uh, that wasn't here. I think that was under beam weapons, or energy weapons. Turret tracking speed. Yeah, it's starting to be pretty pricey, so I don't think we'll worry about getting the next level of that right now. Um, under missile and kinetic weapons, we may want to get some more of those, but I think I'll hold off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw more labs over here at Ethan Wilkins to work on his missile agility. So March and May. So March, which we are in March now, I think one more tick actually is going to finish that active sensor. And it did. Good. Now, how is our sensor tech looking otherwise? Next active level tech sensor is pretty high up. Uh, we do want to get more beam fire control range for things. So actually, I'm going to get started work on that. That's, this is going to be useful for our CIWS. So sort of a point defense system over here. Um, did I steal all your labs away? Oh, oh, that's because George Jackson is still researching um, some stuff. Okay. Yeah, the EM sensor sensitivity, actually, that is pretty important. In fact, it's going to be uh, important for our active sensors. So I'm just going to go ahead and queue up some more tech over here. Yeah, you guys keep working on those labs. It's going to be fine. Oh, they're going to both finish in May, which is nice. Uh, I am gonna. I need to finish the EM sensor sensitivity before we do anything more. Oh, the, ref the refit finished. The maple syrup A, extra sticky, right over here. So it's still the maple syrup A. We just refit it with the new engine. So now it's the extra sticky. It has huge range. So we're going to tell it to, once again, survey nearest bodies, which are going to be quite far away. If your fuel goes down to less than 30%, refuel at the colony. Good luck, my friend. There you go. Yeah, 
And I think they go faster than they used to. There's the maple syrup. Yeah, 3,000 kilometers per second is pretty good. It's going to go pretty far. It's going to mostly hunt down some of the remaining uh, comets, but those will be really useful when we do jump. Um, the Coates Colony created a new freighter for us. Excellent. And is scrapping some stuff. So I guess we didn't actually get around to designing our military ships this time. There was a bit too much science to do and a little bit too much to talk about. But what I'm going to do as a teaser, this is our design for our battle fleet that I figured out. Hey, official using spreadsheets. Woo! Um, our battle fleet is going to involve multiple ships that are highly specialized. Our PDC, we designed our PDCs to have point defense missiles, to have long range missiles, to have um, active sensors to cover both enemy ships and enemy missiles, plus fire control for our anti-ship missiles and anti-missile missiles. We are instead going to have specialized ships working in concert. They are going to be, I'm going to just, I mean, just as a label, I'm going to call this a destroyer squadron. It's going to have three different ship designs involved. It is going to have the destroyer leader over here. This is going to be our command ship. We're going to have one of them in the squadron. This is going to have a jump drive in it. It's going to be the only ship in the squadron that has a jump drive, but it's going to be a jump drive that's going to be designed so that it can actually jump the entire squadron together or the entire task group together as one go. Um, so it's going to be responsible for being able to get us in and out of systems if that were to come up. Most importantly, especially for our defense of Seoul, the Seoul system, is this is going to be our sensor boat. It's going to have, it's going to be the only thing with active anti-ship and anti-missile sensors. It's the only thing that's going to have active sensors because active sensors are relatively expensive. They take up a fair amount of space. Um, and also they make you stand out like crazy on enemy sensors themselves, on enemy radar, which means um, by only having one ship with this, it, there's a chance the other ships won't be quite as visible. And as a result, this is also going to act as our damage soaker. It's going to get some extra CIWS. CIWS is Gauss cannons, Gauss guns that um, fire at incoming missiles, but it's totally automated. They've got their own built-in sensors. They've got their own uh, fire control all built in. You don't have to tell them to do anything. They just automatically fire at any missiles that are coming in to range. Uh, there's just a couple of caveats. One, they're, they're relatively short range. This is basically like the last possible second we are going to try to shoot this thing down. Also, they only protect the ship that they are on. Um, as opposed to point defense missiles or point defense beams that you might design uh, that could shoot down any missile that comes within range. This is really short range, only protects this ship itself. Um, we're going to look into that more of that next episode, obviously. In addition to that, we are going to have heavy armor and potentially even some shields. Because this is going to have the active sensors, there's a good chance that the enemy is going to focus fire on this thing, especially with any long range weapons. Once enemies get close in range, then they should be able to spot absolutely everything. But long range, it's mostly just going to be the analog light bulb class destroyer leader that's going to be visible so it's going to likely have a lot of missiles fired at it so I, I don't know exactly what these numbers are going to be but it's going to have some extra close in weapon system defense definitely trying to make sure to pack on a lot of armor and a lot of shields but no actual guns on this thing this is thing has got to stay alive because it's the only thing that gives us vision and it's the only thing that's going to provide us with a jump drive capability after that we're going to have probably in this battle fleet three just destroyers these are simply going to be anti-ship missile boats. They're just going to pack missiles, uh, either going to be five or six in terms of size. They're just going to pack those and they're just going to be designed to fire at enemy ships. They're just going to have their their single or maybe it will may, might pair up the missile fire control, but that's it. They won't need active sensors at all. We will give them some uh, CIWS protection, but not as much, and you know, sort of medium-ish armor and maybe no shields, don't know. And then finally, we've got the Knight 1376 Destroyer Escort class, I'm calling this. This is just a point defense missile boat. It's going to be equipped simply with our point defense missile launchers. These are going to be anti-missile missiles, and that's its job. Its job is going to be to focus on shooting down um, uh, enemy missiles that might be coming into range, and it's going to try to protect our entire battle fleet with that. Um, then I've got a couple other tabs. We'll have to wait until next episode to talk about that. Thanks for watching. Next episode, for sure, we design our combat fleet. See you next time.